Teen Titans was a pretty weird show. Don't misunderstand, it absolutely holds up and is one of the best animated shows ever made, but it wasn't one you would have expected when an adaptation of the Teen Titans was greenlit. Despite being named the Teen Titans, the comic book iteration of these characters were well into adulthood, with the exception of Beast Boy. The team was made up of sidekicks like Robin and Speedy, or those related to other heroes like Donna Troy. Before the release of Teen Titans, there was Batman the Animated Series, Superman the Animated Series, Batman Beyond, and Justice League. These shows shared a consistent art style under the direction of Bruce Timm, and as a result, Teen Titans stuck out like a sore thumb. The characters, transitions, expressions, and overall tone of the show were all heavily inspired by Japanese media and animation, combined with the art style Bruce Timm made popular, taking influence from shows like Kikaida, Cyborg 009, Go Ranger, and Fooly Cooly, the latter being a large portion of said influence. This can be seen in the character designs, constant art style changes, and design of its action set pieces. This style set Teen Titans apart from every other Western action cartoon at the time, and like Avatar The Last Airbender, would be a great introduction for viewers into the world of anime. Glenn Murakami, the show's creator, producer, and character designer, explained it best in an old interview. We knew we wanted to do a show about a character. It was a show that focused on teenagers and more emotional things, so we thought it was a good way to express all that. We talked about exaggerating everything. When someone's embarrassed, they'll look really small. We'll experiment with that sort of style of storytelling. I think it's not so much ripping off anime, as much as it's a kind of storytelling. The marriage of anime with Teen Titans was a no-brainer. Why not render a show about preteens and teenagers in a way that appeals to that demographic? However, the targeted age range of 6 to 11 year olds meant a lot of the source material had to be reworked. With it came a lighter tone, as well as a shift towards internal and external conflicts for the characters that would resonate with that audience. This didn't stop them from delving into dark subject matters, but it did mean they had to be more creative about it. Each season of the show focused on one member of the Titans going against a specific villain or group. Season 1 was Robin, Season 3 was Cyborg, 4 was Raven, 5 was Beast Boy, and the Trouble in Tokyo film centered around Starfire. Season 2, however, focused on one notable character in the comics lore, Terra. Terra was conceived by George Perez and Marv Wolfman for the new Teen Titans comic series that ran from 1980 to 1984, specifically for the event known as the Judas Contract. This is arguably the most memorable storyline in the old Teen Titans canon, and not only helped shape the team's characteristics, but also their stories going forward. While the Judas Contract would occur during the Tales of the Teen Titans run that came after, her first introduction was in issue 26 of the new Teen Titans, where she was first introduced as a frightened child who preferred to do things alone. Initially appearing villainous, she got over her issues and decided to join the Titans. It took three issues of Beast Boy attempting to help her until she decided to take up his offer. She seemed to be a good fit for the group, especially since her Earth manipulation powers were far too effective not to have. Yet behind the scenes, it turns out Terra had a different plan, one that was meant to shock not only the Titans, but the readers themselves. Two years prior, Marvel also had a teenage girl by the name of Kitty Pryde join a team of heroes. First appearing in X-Men issue 129, she was a sweet, well-meaning girl who would become a well-known staple of the X-Men for years to come. Terra was conceived to be the opposite of what Kitty exemplified. On the surface, she was a normal teenage girl, but in reality, she was a psychopath that deliberately tricked the Titans. Furthermore, she was partnered with Deathstroke the Terminator and helped spy on their every move. Everything from her initial appearance, her romance with Beast Boy, and reason for joining were all a fabrication to gain their trust and destroy the Titans from the inside. This eventually led to a self-inflicted death after believing a possessed Deathstroke betrayed her, which caused her to feel truly alone for the first time and lose her grip on reality. While Terra did have some moments of genuine humanity, she wasn't meant to be sympathetic. She was a psychopathic character that deliberately fooled the very people who gave her a family for the sake of villainy. As Morph Wolfman stated, What we didn't want to do is state that because she was this or because she was that, she was evil. There are people who are just not nice. They could be brought up in the best situations or whatever, it won't make a difference. Wonder Girl was brought up in an identical situation, only she turned out good. There was absolutely nothing in Terra's background that should have made her the type of character she was. The X-Men had just introduced a new member to their group. 
I'd do the same. I'd play her first as a villain, then seemingly reform her and have her join the Titans. Only I'd have her constantly lie to the Titans, change her stories, do suspicious things, and in general make her a loose. I could do that because comic book convention would demand that readers ignore all the evidence and assume she was a good girl. After all, the X-Men's Kitty Pride was a heroine, so even the lying, cheating, conniving Tara Markov had to have a heart of gold, right? Wrong. From the very beginning, Terra was conceived as a villainess. It was the first time a member of a superhero group ever proved to be a spy, not a traitor. She was always working for the Terminator. Playing on the comic reader's expectations worked. Everything about Terra was made to reflect the ideas of what comic book readers expected out of certain characters. They'd imagine someone like Raven to portray the group, because of her demeanor, abilities, and appearance. They wouldn't think this reformed teenage girl would be in bed with Slade. This gave the audience a mirror that reflected their own preconceived notions of what people were like based on social norms and appearances. The beauty of the Judas Contract was how it used the tropes of its own medium to trick its readers, but because of that it left elements black and white. This isn't bad, it is after all a product of its time frame. What it allowed is for a future adaptation to delve deeper. And this is where the TV show comes in. everything about you. I've been watching you for some time. I know why you're always running away. I know your secret, little girl. The 2003 incarnation of Terra was the complete opposite of what came before. She was funny, heroic, and a bundle of joy. However, the major difference between the TV show and her comic book counterpart all stems from one thing. She can't control her powers. That may not seem like a big deal, but it goes to show how a slight alteration to a character can change everything about them. Terra's control issue leads to severe insecurity, serving as a catalyst for unfortunate fate. The show had already tackled this with other characters, but Terra's problem was different because manipulating the Earth led to collateral damage. Earthquakes, avalanches, mudslides. Everywhere you go, you try to do good. And everywhere, you fail. So everyone turns against you. Imagine if every time you tried to help someone, it not only failed, but people ended up hating you for it. All because of something you felt you should be able to handle. Life is hard enough without being a social pariah, and ultimately you would steel yourself against any form of emotional attachment, whether that's platonically or romantically. You become afraid of letting people into your life because of fears that are, to you, completely justified. Therefore, Slade is able to get her to join his side rather easily. One might think, why would Terra join Slade, who's obviously a bad guy? Except she only has the Titans' word for it. Despite their eagerness to accept Terra into their ranks, they know nothing about her. They don't know where she's from, her struggles, or anything truly personal. Except for Beast Boy, who finds out about her issue by accident. Thus, when she thinks Beast Boy told Robin her secret, that trust gets utterly shattered. Which could have been avoided if she simply confided in people. But that's what makes her a tragic character. It's a vicious cycle of suffering. She can't control her powers, which leads to severe insecurity, developing into trust issues, and eventually to emotional instability. She chose not to tell the Titans her secret because of her past, allowing Slade to corrupt her moral compass by digging into her fears because he knew her secret would get out. It always does one way or another. This gives Terra a substantial motivation for wanting to get revenge on the Titans when she returns a few episodes later. Well... All except for one. In the original story, Terra saw Beast Boy as nothing but a nuisance, but she eventually got along with him in the end, leading to a kiss on the pier. Yet, like everything else, this was just a ruse, a trick to lure him into a false sense of security. It caused Beast Boy to take things seriously from then on out, a warning about naivety and what happens when you're blind to one's red flags by projecting an idea of what that person is like. Beast Boy was a representation of the comic book audience's expectations of Terra. 
In the animated series, Beast Boy isn't simply a love interest, but a main cause of her villainy, a showcase of how insecurity can blind us and damage potential relationships. Terra isn't trying to trick Beast Boy at any point prior to her downfall. Their relationship isn't set up as a one-sided crush, but rather a mutual attraction, with Beast Boy supplying emotional support that genuinely helps Terra's confidence over the course of the episode. Even when she believed Beast Boy betrayed her trust and returns to the story of the group, she never stopped having feelings for him, going as far as to save him from the ambush at Titan's Tower. However, Slade uses this as a way to keep Terra on his side, a callback to the original comics where Deathstroke feared the Titans would change her over time. Slade knew that Terra had reservations with what she was doing. Spying on people is easy, setting them up for slaughter is far worse. So he keeps an eye on her from the shadows, revealing himself only when the two are at their most emotionally vulnerable. A first kiss. As Beast Boy and Slade fight, Terra, unable to cope with her situation, runs into a hall of mirrors and is confronted with what she's done. Reminiscent of the ending of Baby Doll and Batman the Animated Series, a beautifully directed piece of visual storytelling that says more about her than words ever could. This mental breakdown continues to show how diabolical Slade truly is and why Terra was easily manipulated. He's not only a formidable foe physically, but also a master of mind games. He forces the two to think with their emotions, not their heads, meaning when Beast Boy confronts Terra about her actions, he doesn't see her as the girl he was falling in love with, but rather as the person who betrayed him. So it was all a game? You were just pretending? No, oh, you said you'd be my friend no matter what, remember? Slade was right. You don't have any friends. Leaving Terra to feel truly alone after opening her heart, effectively crushing any sense of morality and compassion that she once had, making Slade her only remaining supportive figure, which allowed her to defeat the Titans two episodes later and take over the city with no remorse. Her eventual death becomes all the more tragic when she attempts to free herself of Slade's control because she finally realized what Beast Boy meant. Everything that happened was made of her own volition, running away from the Titans, joining Slade, setting the trap, taking over the city. She made these choices willingly. What stings the most? That I tricked you? That I nearly wiped out your team? That everyone liked me better than you? Or is it that deep down inside, you really believed I was your friend? I trusted you! We trusted you! I gave you everything and you treated us like dirt! It's a topic many suffering from severe insecurity or depression face, myself included. At the end of the day, mental issues do not excuse bad actions. You ultimately made a bad decision, but it's also within your power to correct those mistakes. That's the beauty of individual choice, that mistakes can be amended. This is exemplified when Terra turns to stone, sacrificing herself to save the city, and finally, herself. Symbolically and literally becoming part of the Earth. All of this culminates in the series finale when it's revealed that she returned to normal and keeps it a secret from the Titans. Despite ambiguity of who she really is, it's been everything but confirmed that this is in fact Terra. Also, she can attempt to lead a normal life, putting her past actions behind her for the sake of not only herself, but the world. She tried to be a hero, but wasn't cut out to be one, giving her a subdued resolution by putting aside her past for the greater good, and finally understanding who she is and why she walked away. This ironically makes her a bigger hero than she ever was. This is how you flesh out a character. Terra was changed from a psychopathic manipulator to one that had clear motivations for her actions. In a series about characters that haven't yet worked out their own place in the world, this adaptation of the Judas Contract, more than any arc, solidifies that mantra. Come with me. You go. You're the Teen Titan. That's who you are. That's not me. I'm not a hero. I'm not out to save the world. I'm just a girl with a geometry test next period and I haven't studied. Adaptations are tricky but when executed properly can be just as good as what was there before. With the limitations of their target audience came a brilliant solution. The creators and writer Amy Wolfram went and made Terra's storyline a tragic descent into villainy, rather than a cautionary tale of naivety and established expectations. 
You see the decline of a sweet girl into a cold-hearted, malicious character, culminating in a bittersweet truth that not everyone is meant for something greater. To understand who you are, to be happy with who you are, and that life will often force you to make decisions you do not want to make, but must. The 2003 adaptation of The Judas Contract is wonderfully mature for the audience it's targeting. The twist of Tara's betrayal wasn't the goal as it was back in the 80s. It was to showcase the manipulative quality of the show's villain, steal the titans for future conflicts, and make us care about a lonely little girl who wanted to do good. Tara wasn't a villain, nor was she a hero. She was just... Tara.